Salam and peace. This is Imam Malik Mujahid, and you're watching Muslim Network TV. Muslim Network TV always there on Galaxy 19 satellite, as well as on uh, Amazon Fire TV, Raku, and a lot of social media, but always on MuslimNetwork.tv as well. This is the first uh, Muslim television in America, in English language, in which Muslims are get hosts, and they are talking uh, with uh, our neighbors. All the time it happens. What is happening to Islamo Islamophobia? Have you heard about it lately? Um, it seems that, uh, uh, you know, many of the hate mongers are uh, just Islamophobes like Pamela Geller and Robert Spencer and David Yerushesmi are looking for something to do because I checked uh, Google News this morning, not much about them. They used to be all over creating hate against Muslim. Um, it seems that uh, uh, the hate mongers have now learned about uh, other format, uh, other forms of hate, or maybe they have discovered intersectionality. Uh, so, uh, so when it comes to hate against blacks, uh, along with hate against Muslims and cheering uh, supporters of building a wall on the southern border or cheering uh, a ban on poor refugees from around the world um, and defending icon of confederacy all around. So, so our opposition to wearing masks. I mean, that's where Islamophobes are busy. Uh, discovering intersectionality of hate itself. I think I am the one who coined the term intersectionality of hate. Normally, people used to use term intersectionality in terms of people positively trying to change uh, the world. In the meantime, Islamophobia has gone international. Coined here, probably books written here about it, uh, but China is using the same Islamophobia and hate and has created the largest concentration camp since the Nazis, where the Uyghur people are forced to uh, do free labors. And I have met some of those people who, who came out and have horrible stories to tell about those concentration camps. And India, well, land of Gandhi and land of Taj Mahal, nobody cares for those things, as it has now two genocide alerts. And they are saying citizenship will be good for Hindus, but not for Muslims. And uh, and reoccupation of Kashmir, all saying they are fighting terrorism and extremism. Actually, they have coined the term uh, and hashtag a uh, Corona Jihad and blaming pandemic on Muslims. While it, China and America are blaming each other, they are blaming directly uh, Muslims there. And I was in international court of justice in Hague, Netherlands, um, uh, watching uh, in the court uh, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi, the leader of Burma, and she was shamelessly defending the genocide against Rohingyas there. Uh, I don't think uh, not many people were tuned into what she was saying, but, uh, but, but people are doing that. So international Islamophobia has left America in somewhat ways. Uh, but gone international, creating hate in a bigger way. And uh, in the midst of all of this, uh, there is a Catholic who, who left a monastery and uh, got into an island and dedicated himself building bridges of understanding among Christians and Muslims. And uh, this unique person probably is the only person in America who has written, uh, who is consulted not only by Muslim organization, but uh, governments around the world. And he has probably written more books, more scholarly books on Islam and articles uh, than probably anyone else in the United States. When people think of John Esposito, they think of Islam. Welcome to Muslim Network TV, John. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here today. Okay. Professor John Esposito is professor of many things. Not only people are professor of one thing, is professor of religion and international affairs, as well as professor of Islamic studies at the Georgetown University. Uh, John Esposito is founding director of Al-Walid Center 
for Muslim Christian understanding and the bridges uh, and the bridge initiative protecting pluralism ending Islamophobia uh, in the Walsh School of Foreign Service. He is past president of American Academy of Religion and Middle Eastern Studies Association of North America. And he has served many uh, in a consulting position, many governments, especially the US Department of State. Wow, how a Catholic got into Islam so much, John? Well, was, uh, the irony is that I had no interest in Islam when I uh, went to graduate school. I had been in a monastery and then I had um, become a young Catholic theologian and teacher in Pennsylvania. And I wanted to get a doctorate and Temple University had a doctorate where you could major in one religion and minor in two. And I thought I would major in Catholicism to finish my PhD. But we were required to take a course in world religions, all the students, a one year course. Buddhism. And so I was gonna do a pro, uh, dissertation in Hinduism and the chair said, why don't you uh, take some courses in Islam? And I said, why, you know, why would I do that? Uh, I didn't have much of an interest in it. I was young, married, wanted to finish my degree. This was the late 60s, early 70s, um, raised in New York. And um, I had all kinds of, it, to the extent that I knew anything, there were stereotypes about Arabs, etc. But I took a course with Ismail al faruqi Palestinian, and uh, basically that changed the rest of my life, the trajectory, the rest of my life. Wow, that's a powerful professor who can change uh, somebody's uh, trajectory of life. But he educated me for unemployment because when I finished my degree, there were no jobs in, in the US. There was maybe one job. And so he said to me, he could get me a job in Gaddafi's Libya or uh, he could get me one in uh, apartheid South Africa. And I said, <laughs> I really don't think I want to do that at this point. You know, I'm young, married. And then uh, it wasn't until uh, the Iranian revolution um, that my career took off and I could work on Islam. Before that, I basically was a professor teaching world religions because I was trained in that. So it's really, and I would say that America, it, America's encounter began with the Iranian revolution. So you're very thankful to Khomeini. Did you write him a letter of thank you or send him some card or something? Well, it's funny. I often say that I owe my career, my first Lexus to the Ayatollah. <laughs> so Ayatollah may not have a Lexus. You got one. <laughs> That's right. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. So uh, how do you work? I mean, 55 books, including a, editing an encyclopedia on Islam. How do you discipline that much? Uh, I mean, uh, did they put you on some sort of diet on the monastery? I think that uh, what really part of what happened was that when I was in the monastery, we used to get up every day at uh, 4.55 a.m. So it became part of my DNA to be able to do that. And so after my wife and I were married, um, I found it easy uh, to get up very early. And so for many years, I would get up at five o'clock. We would go out and exercise and I could be at my desk very early in the morning. And uh, and, and I, it was a very disciplined late into the night. I don't operate quite that way these days. I, I get up early, but uh, I, I knock off at five o'clock, 5.30. But in the old days, I would you know, have these very long hours. So I was, I was very, very lucky and I had lots of opportunities. Uh, I was blessed. So you know, I never thought I would publish a book in my career. And when I saw that first book, it was like when somebody has a baby or at least <laughs> have another baby, whatever, you know? So for me, it was, I, you know, seeing my name on the spine of a book, I'm first generation to go to college. This was an incredible experience. Well, as a person who has written only one published books, uh, I mean, I'm just amazed that you have written 55. I mean, that requires quite a bit of discipline. Uh, well, so uh, monastery in some way helped you. Yeah, no, I, I think the, I think the monastery did in in terms of uh, e even more than that, it, it reinforced uh, some of the the better virtues uh, that came from my parents and that what I grew up with, you know, my my sense of a lot of different things of 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 justice, of, of equity, etc. Um, but, you know, there's also a downside uh, uh, to monastic life. I mean, it, it was a, a positive thing, but. After X number of years, uh, I just felt that although I wanted to move on to ordination as a priest, I knew that 
I, I didn't want to spend my whole life doing that. And, and so the idea that I'd wind up where I am now, given my, my background for so many years, I'd wanted to be a priest from the third grade in grammar school. It was a big adjustment, but uh, yeah, I, I'm very grateful to, to a lot of people. Hmm. I mean, you mentioned parents and you mentioned justice and equity. I mean, that's prophetic. I mean, and uh, as you probably know, there is a verse in the Quran that God sent all the prophets for one purpose, to help people establish al-qist, which is justice, fairness, and equity. Mm. So it, it is a prophetic call. Now, spending so many years in Islamic studies and connected with the international affairs and all that, so, so what is your reflection on the current state of Islamic studies in the United States? Well, I think in terms of Islamic studies itself, uh, it has grown enormously. Uh, what a lot of people aren't aware of is that, for example, uh, the Middle East Studies Association um, very rarely in the old days had any panels that dealt with Islam, certainly that dealt with Islam in the world today, because in those days, in the 60s, 70s, even into the 80s, there was a sense of uh, secularization, you know, and modernization. And so, as one social scientist put it, the choice was between Mecca and mechanization. <laughs> the Academy of Religions had no, uh, it, it, it was of the major world religions, but it was mostly Judaism, Christianity, and then uh, Buddhism and Hinduism. And then finally, uh, Faruqi and some of his graduate students, including me, uh, petitioned to have uh, Islam admitted you know, as it were, and represented. Well, today, uh, if you go to an AAR meeting, uh, there are just, you know, panels and panels over numbers of days that deal with various aspects of Islam, Muslim life, uh, Muslim, Islam in society. So it's a, it's a much different world in terms of that. On the other hand, uh, we're still living at a time uh, when to my, everybody's, at least to my surprise, uh, the, the result of 9-11 and after 9-11 and the growth of Islamophobia with some of the people that you mentioned, um, that has really turned it into the, a, a place where Islam became, uh, Islamophobia became normalized. You know, the, in newspapers, people could say and write anything that they wanted. Uh, as I like to put it, if, they, if you took some pieces that people could, could write about and uh, you put in another religion when they attack Islam, you know, take Islam out, and put Judaism or Catholicism, et cetera, it would be unheard of for an editor to touch some of these stories. Uh, and I think where we are today, the, you know, the, the growth of, of violence, you know, uh, in recent years, it, 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 it began to grow significantly uh, during the Obama administration, but certainly with President Trump, it's, you know, it's gone through the roof, as has a lot of this sort of hate view of the world. Anti-Semitism has gone up. So that's, that's the other side of the coin. So, so if Islamic studies, you're saying, is, is the field has grown, has the study of Islamophobia at the university grown in the same way because the people probably are realizing what's going on in society? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think if you actually look now, um, I did a book, an edited volume with a colleague uh, called uh, Islamophobia uh, and the Challenge of Pluralism in the 21st Century. Um, there weren't too many books appearing at that time. Edward Said had dealt with this issue and a number of others. Now, if you look up Islamophobia on Amazon, you'll see an awful lot of books have, have, have been published uh, and have come out. Uh, it's getting that visibility that's important. That's why we created the bridge. Um, and for, fortunately, uh, on the bridge now, we have about 1.2 million followers. Uh, and it can make a difference. I, our, our whole sense was that Islamophobia has become so... Uh, accepted by significant percentages of people, certainly very clearly if you look at the percentages with regard to, I hate to say this, but a significant number of people in the Republican Party and certainly influenced by President Trump, who said Islam hates us, not Muslim extremists hate us, who put in the Muslim ban, etc. And if we look across the world, as you noted, it's now become global. You, you have Islamophobia in countries where there aren't any, any Muslims or very few like Hungary and Poland. Hmm. So what aspects of uh, <clears throat> Islamic studies do you think are still not uh, fully developed or you, you think people need to be studying uh, in those particular areas? Well, I think that uh, it's, it's, it's important uh, 
to pursue a number of areas. Uh, we do have a, a growing number of scholars, both Muslim and non-Muslim. For example, in Quranic studies and the study of Hadith, um, we do have a growing number of people who um, uh, write on Islam in various aspects. Uh, but we also have at the same time, uh, because it's become a popular topic, uh, many social scientists, whereas in the old days, uh, in international relations, et cetera, um, social scientists felt no need to deal with religion and its role in politics and society. Now that's become a booming area. In contrast, uh, often in, in Islamic studies, it, it took a while before people were looking at the modern period, you know, and really focusing there. The, it was a much more uh, tradition and, and, and history uh, kind of uh, view and, and perception and approach. Uh, so that it's only been in, in really in relatively recent years where you see uh, scholars who are trained in religion and can deal with the issue of politics. But I think it's important that people be grounded and know the religious tradition well in order to address certain kinds of issues. You know, like if you see violence, is this something that's endemic, you know, to Muslims and Islam? I mean, I've been in the field for 40 years and uh, and for many years asked the same basic, basic questions. What is Islam? Is Islam a particularly violent religion? You know, uh, issues about the life of the Prophet Muhammad. Um, and uh, it's, it's taken a long time to begin to break through that. But we still have significant, significant problems in public space. Look at the numbers of uh, members of Congress uh, during both the Ob Obama period, right down to the Trump period, whether they were running for Congress or they were presidential candidates who would bring Islam uh, up as an issue. You know, somebody who's running for president would say, well, he didn't know if, if he could have a Muslim in his in, in his cabinet unless he denied his religion or certainly unless he denied uh, uh, any kind of uh, uh, belief in Sharia, in Islamic law. So we, we, we have a long way to go in terms of, I think, the training and, and, and in the profession. On the other hand, one of the really positive things is that uh, the last time we hired or two times ago, the first, when we hired all of our finalists were Muslim scholars. Now, that took decades to get to that point where you had enough younger Muslims going into that field, training, et cetera, and becoming scholars so that you have both Muslim and non-Muslim scholars of Islam. You're watching Muslim Network TV. This is Imam Malik Mujahid. I'm talking with Professor John Esposito, and we'll be right back after these messages. Welcome back to Muslim Network TV. This is Imam Malik Mujahid. I'm talking with Professor John Esposito, and you're watching Muslim Network TV on Galaxy 19 Satellite, Amazon Fire TV, Raku, and many other places. Uh, Professor, you mentioned that um, before the break that there are, you know, when you're looking for new people, uh, a lot of finalists are Muslims themselves, and that's what uh, used. To, uh, that was not the case before. I have also observed there are multiple seminaries in the Muslim community, and uh, I find a lot of young people who want to study Islam. And do you think uh, you know uh, the the supply is going to be higher than the demand itself? Are 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 these uh, departments and schools? Uh, properly funded to have uh, such a supply? Well, I think that there are a couple of things. Um, I think um, if a young person comes to me for advice, I will tell them what I think are some of the top programs in the country. Um, and I think that um, some of the the, the newer uh, experiments and, and, and approaches uh, in terms of having more of a kind of uh, seminary approach, if you will, or madrasa, um, some of them have... A, the ability in terms of the, the number of faculty uh, and the quality, and others don't. Uh, that's not meant as to be a negative put down, but you need significant resources, you know, to to build uh, a school. 
you know, uh, and I think that some places have those resources and, and, and others uh, just don't. So that a fair number of people who are out and are, if you will, competitive on the market uh, actually, you know, come from, if you will, non-Muslim uh, universities, uh, you know, uh, in the U.S. and overseas. Hmm. So, so, so you advise them to continue to go to school uh, for Islamic studies, or you say, well, why don't you do double major study this, study that? I mean, what is going to be job market like? Oh, I, I mean, I, I always say do do a double major. You know, I say the same thing to people who are in Middle East and, and in Arab studies. The only difference is that as a result of 9-11 and the aftermath of 9-11, that caused a tremendous boom uh, in, 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 in language studies and in uh, Middle East studies and in Islamic studies. So there you had big programs. I can remember a time at Georgetown when even though they were putting multiple sections of Arabic in the week or two before the beginning of the semester, there'd be a panic because they still had more students coming in, you know? Uh, and I think that, that that is changing in a number of ways. Number one, in American academia, as you know, there's a real uh, shrinking in the humanities as compared to an emphasis uh, in some quarters on, on science and the social sciences. Uh, and that's affected the size of some departments and universities and whatnot. Um, and I think that the fact that we're now getting at a distance and there are other kinds of hot areas, um, you know, for example, today, a kid that's looking for a hot area might think about studying Chinese, you know, um, might be focusing more on China or India, uh, you know, than, than maybe uh, on the Middle East. But we still get we still get quite a few students. Uh, but I've noticed a tapering off in, in the last few years. Hmm. So one of the most recent books which you have is on Sharia. I mean, in the United States, there were at one time, there will always be 30, 40 different laws being presented to different uh, uh, state houses. And the, uh, the first law actually was signed uh, by Kansas governor, who is now ambassador at large for the religious uh, freedom around the world. Uh, professor, uh, I mean, Professor, I'm calling him Ambassador Brown Beck, who used to be senator and governor in Kansas and all that. Uh, we don't hear much about those bills. Uh, do you think this uh, Sharia bogey, which was so much focused of Islamophobes, uh, that uh, is withered away? Or do you think uh, that uh, uh, will come back uh, anytime soon? I think the risk is, I mean, first of all, there have been at least 120 attempts to pass these kinds of bills. Uh, and then at certain points when they realized that simply identifying Sharia could be a problem, they would say foreign laws to get that out. The reality of it is, though, that a number of states have signed off on that. Texas, Florida. So, I mean, there, there are a number that have signed off on it. Yeah, close, close to nine, I think, who have yeah. signed on those things. But, but, the, but at the end of the day, uh, the real question in terms of our politics is what will the politics look like? Certainly uh, in the coming elections, there'll be a lot of issues. But one of the issues that's going to come up on the part of, I'm sure, the president uh, will still will be, you know, in, in addition to his denunciation now, just about everybody un un who's not him. So it would be, you know, the liberal Democrats. Uh, it, but it's also going to be uh, the the idea of immigrants, which he still brags about that he's keeping them out. Uh, on the other hand, one has to point out that just yesterday, the House passed a bill that had to do with no ban addressing the Muslim ban. But mm -hmm. you're pretty sure, uh, I, I would be shocked if, if the Senate went along with that, given the influence of, of both Trump and Mitch McConnell. So uh, this could become another issue, you know, uh, in the near future. And I think it's coming up even in the uh, the, the elections now, the congressional elections, when it comes when it comes uh, to a number of the uh, Muslims that were elected to the House, particularly the two women that were elected to the House in the last elections. Yeah, I mean, uh, Rashida Tlaib is uh, struggling for her life. Most likely, yeah. she's the first Palestinian American and, of course, Muslim, uh, who was very strong about the impeachment of uh, uh, Trump. 
I mean, she is in difficult uh, condition, although she was the early uh, supporter uh, who, for, for the no Muslim ban ever uh, coalition. We are part of that coalition as well. Uh, tell me, I mean, the, uh, you know, Saudis are uh, in the news for bad things, substantially. And the person who, uh, you know, who, who respected you enough uh, when you founded the Center for Muslim Christian Understanding at Georgetown uh, in 1993 and became its founding director. So uh, what Prince Saudi Prince Al-Walid bin Talal invested uh, 20 million uh, endowment uh, for that particular program. So how you are in Georgetown uh, work now under a Saudi uh, connection type of a thing, although that Walid himself, I think, have been in some sort of a prison or something there for a while. Well, Awalid, I mean, Awalid is a very interesting person. Uh, as you probably know, right after 9-11, he went to the site and he presented uh, Rudy Giuliani with a check, you know, uh, for support, to express support. In a private note that he wrote to him, he mentioned, which is true, that one of the issues that we're going to have to deal with globally uh, that can lead to radicalization is the issue of Palestine and, you know, Palestine and Israel, etc. Giuliani went public, rejected the check, etc. What got blocked out when people re reported at that time and after is that Awali was very concerned about the, the understanding of the Arab world of America and, and the reverse. Among other reasons, Awali did his undergraduate degree on the West Coast. He did a master's degree at Syracuse University. He dealt with American and, and Western businessmen all the time. So at the end of the day, he wound up supporting uh, American studies at American University of Cairo and at the uh, American University in, in Beirut. And then in, in the States, he supported at Harvard and Georgetown the study of uh, Islam, Muslim Christian relations. And then he also supported two uh, in the UK. Now, our, our funding came in from our lead, oh, maybe nine years ago, I forget, nine or 10 years ago. Uh, and he's always been very supportive, but always detached. He always said to me from the very beginning, you know, whatever you want to do, you do. He was not, he was not a donor who stayed in touch a lot. He was not a donor who said, oh, I have a relative or a friend of my relative wants to go to Georgetown. You know, can you, can you get him an appointment with the president, et cetera? So, you know, in fact, it's still interesting that the Islamophobes love to talk about the Saudi funding, you know, of our center at Georgetown. What they really want to say is, and they do, they don't like what we say. Uh, you know, we don't we don't buy into their hate agenda when it comes to Islam and Muslims. And so it's an attempt to discredit. Having said that, I think uh, and one should remember that Al-Walid was among the prominent businessmen who were arrested and held uh, for quite a few months. Uh, and at least as media reports uh, have it, uh, they were released when, in fact, they gave significant amounts of money. Uh, to the government, that is to the, the crown prince. I'm talking about billions of dollars each in some cases. Um, and there, there, there are issues, I think, today uh, when one looks at uh, some of the ways in which uh, the, the current government uh, you know, has been operating, both uh, certainly on the, international, uh, on the international stage. Yemen's a good example, but, but there are others. The support for Sisi in fact, even in the planning, let alone after he came to power in a coup d'etat. So there, there's that other side of, of the coin, but that, that, that complicates the whole situation. You know, it, it, Saudis in general are not responsible for necessarily for what their government does. And, but when we get, when we get into the, the media use of it, uh, it, it, is, it is a difficulty. And under this administration, there, with the Secretary of Education, there's been a real move uh, to really... Uh, uh, an aggressive move uh, with regard to centers of, of Arab studies, Middle East studies, and also those that deal with, with Islam. You're watching Muslim Network TV. This is Imam Malik Mujahid, and I'm talking with Professor John Esposito. And you're watching us on Galaxy 19 satellite, Amazon Fire TV, Raku, and other social media. We'll be right back after these messages.
Welcome back to Muslim Network TV. This is Imam Malik Mujahid, and I'm talking with Professor John Esposito. Uh, John, you have this center, Christian Muslim Understanding. Uh, has understanding between two religions improved somewhat uh, as a result of the efforts uh, put forth by the Institute? Well, I think so. I mean, I think that, um, you know, I was very lucky when, when, when we began it, and, and this was under a, a, an earlier donor, Hasib Sabat, um, I had a, an open situation in terms of being able to hire, you know, some of the really prominent scholars in the field who were out there. Uh, and as a result, it, over the years that we've existed, since 1993, we've, we've published an enormous number of books and articles, done an incredible amount of, of media work, and, uh, and, and most of us traveled, uh, you know, many, many miles. I've, I've chalked up close to three million miles uh, in my career anyway, uh, for Georgetown. And so I, th I think that we've been very much out there and I, I, th and I think we've had an impact. But of course, I mean, the impact comes from an awful lot of other people, you know, first rate scholars uh, in the US uh, and in Europe and, and a number of them uh, in the Muslim world, particularly if they write in English in terms of then, you know, having that that impact. So it's much different. It, it, I mean, Majahid, you would remember it was only, what, maybe 20 years ago, you could go into a bookstore and see a wall of books on Christianity, a wall on Judaism, and you'd be lucky if you found one or two books, maybe a course. Those will be anti-Muslim to begin with. Yeah. And, and I have physically done that, John. I have gone to bookstores as normally I go places to enjoy along with garden or bookstore. And I will look at it, and you're saying exactly what I observed. And, and what's happened uh, in, in with the rise of Islamophobia, uh, many of them, Robert Spencer and others, would make it, you know, to the, you know, bestseller list because they they write these provocative things, and they're writing quote unquote about an enemy, uh, and it was it was amazing. It's it's, it's uh, tapered off quite a bit, but for a number of years, the more bizarre the the book. And uh, and with no looking at what's the background and training of the person that's writing, you know, uh, uh, it it really it took off in that way. But at least now, uh, when you're talking about going on Amazon, you know, uh, or going to bookstores, uh, but particularly, you know, you'll see lots and lots of books on Islam, and many of them are are really done by reputable scholars, and it's really good. But as I say, in the old days, it was hard even coming up with materials. When I first got involved, a lot of my books came about because I was teaching and I suddenly saw we don't have a collection of the writings of Muslims on all of these things. So I did, you know, Islam in transition or voices of resurgent in Islam and, and, you know, brought together scholars to kind of fill that kind of gap. And, and there's been a, a good group of people coming out of a number of universities uh, in the U.S. Uh, that had been very uh, involved. Uh, Duke, North Carolina, University of Chicago, Harvard, uh, Santa Barbara, and I Sorry, some of my friends, because I can't remember their university right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you're correct. I did to, to prepare for this show, I went to Amazon. And about seven, eight years ago, I will go on Amazon. I will top bestseller on Islam. And sometime out of top 10, there will be seven, eight by Robert Spencer. Yeah. yeah. This morning when I went there, I couldn't find a single one of these, which is a bestseller uh, at this moment uh, among the top 10 one. So I think things have changed. I used to, before any time I will speak six, seven, eight years ago, I will check Amazon bestseller list. I will share with the people that, hey, this is what I found. And so these people have fed away. So that impact is definitely there. Uh, there was some letter which came out uh, uh, what was it called? The uh, a common word between Muslims and Christians, and uh, they, there was a quite a bit. Uh, I mean, I don't remember any initiative uh, by Muslims uh, in the world which has gotten so much positive traction. What was that phenomena? What happened? And uh, is it is still part of discourse somewhere? It's you know it came at a at a at a, a good time, uh, and uh, in the sense that when it was brought out, it was put together, came out of Jordan. Uh, Prince Ghazi oversaw that project. Um, a number of us were involved in it. 
uh, you you early on had, I think it was in the New York Times, a list of, I don't know what, 100, 200 uh, professors of religion and Islamic studies that were signing off on the importance of something like a common word between us and you. The message was coming from a group of Muslim scholars, and you could do it in an age of globalization with globalization and communications. You could have a cross section of Muslim scholars across the world, basically coming behind a document that basically said, we have our differences between the two religions, but you know we share a lot in common, and we also share a lot in an age of globalization. And so both religious, for religious reasons, and because we are concerned about the safety and security of our societies, we need to come together. And what do we share in common? And love of God and love of neighbor. It's, it's part of our scriptures. And they backed it up. If you go to the website for a common word, you'll see incredible documentation from the Bible and from the Quran. Then when it was launched, they launched it both at, at Yale, at Cambridge University in the UK, and at Georgetown. Uh, at Yale, they did theology and had people from all over the world. Cambridge, they did uh, scripture. And at Georgetown, we did the kind of, so what and where does it go from here? In other words, the whole question of social impact. Uh, and I, I think it got a lot of run. Uh, it, 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 it affected a lot of people. And there, there were places that would, people would write to you and say that they were using it. People in, in the Philippines, even in the Southern Philippines, et cetera. But I think after a while, it lost some of that, uh, that, that drive uh, because people moved on to other things. And you know, when you want to have something as a movement, you need to have people who stay with that movement rather than move to another movement. And it takes financing. You know? So, I mean, for example, we have this bridge initiative, which is run for about five years. Well, to do that, you need to fundraise for your budget every year. And you can have a booming situation uh, we were quoted just yesterday in the Huffington Post with regard to the the uh, congressional uh, the story on uh, Congress passing this no ban. Okay, uh, and we've got, as I said before, you know, 1.2 million followers. But you need for that to continue to go, not just that you have success and you've got the researches, but the funding has to keep coming in, and that becomes critical. And so I think that's what's affected a lot of very good. Uh, projects that you then, they become part of, if you will, history, as in recent history or past history. Hmm. Tell us a little more about Bridges. Uh, uh, Bridges, I keep calling uh, Bridge Program. Uh, is it connected with the uh, Christian Muslim Understanding uh, Department or is it an independent project? It's, it's, uh, no, it's very much. It's part of uh, the center. Uh, uh, I basically created it when I uh, was uh, as director, the idea and did the fundraising, director of the center. And then um, uh, when colleagues took over, uh, Jonathan Brown, one of our uh, Muslim scholars, and now Tamara San, I uh, moved over and became uh, director of, of Bridge along with uh, Tamara San. Um, and I think, you know, if people go there, what, what, what it's valuable for is we have somebody who every day, who's based in Europe, but uh, looks at the world, uh, and uh, Mubashara uh, looks at the world and reports every day on, let's say, the top 10, 20 stories that deal with Muslims and uh, that raise the question of Islamophobia. We have articles, we have podcasts, we have videos, uh, but we also have a section that a lot of people like and quote, a lot of media people, what we call fact sheets. So, you know, when you read an article, you can always say, well, wait a minute. That's the author's opinion, you know, and oh, there are some quotes. Our fact sheets are just facts. So if you go there, you will see fact sheets written on some of the top organizations and individuals who promote Islamophobia globally. You will see coverage of the current administration and its major players, from the president to the vice president to the secretary of state and to many people who've held senior appointments uh, in this administration, and, and they just give you the facts. You know, are these people who have addressed Islam and Muslims? And if so, what have they said? What have they done? You know, what do they do? And we do that for the U.S., we do it for Europe, and we, and we do it for other parts of, of the world. So it really is a go-to place. Uh, we have uh, interviews with, with, with important people, um, and it's a, I, mean, I, I, I advise them to go to the website. It's, a, it's, it's packed with information and every day there's an update. So every day you can update and know that you can find those stories. 
when you look at our media, we've got so much media coverage, but if you want to deal with any area, any country, if you want to know what's happening with Rohingya, with the Uyghurs, you know, what's going on in India, et cetera, you have to count on whether or not on a particular day, and this newspaper or that one that you might be reading is carrying it. Here you can go to a site and pretty much see what are the top pieces that are coming out. And, you know, you go, you know, talk to a lot of State Department and you were on the World Economic Forum's Council of 100 Leaders and EU's European Network of Experts on Radicalization and things like that. Uh, what were the questions people used to ask five years ago and how those questions have changed? Are the people still busy about talking radicalization or it is uh, some other things? A radicalization is, is very much there. I can remember, you know, years go by so fast. My mom said, when you get older, the years go by fast, as opposed to when you're a kid, it's <laughs> so long. And she's right, you know. Uh, sometimes I look up somebody that I kind of knew who was a, an actor who passed away. And also I turn to my wife and go, oh, my God, that was 15 years ago. But I would say um, about five or six years ago, maybe a little more than that, I was talking to an ambassador at the UN. And he was trying to bring attention to Palestine and Israel at the time. And he said, all people want to talk about is CVE, combating violent extremism. And so that, that has remained a major thing. Classic example is when President Trump went to Saudi Arabia. Many people expected that given what he said about Islam and Muslims, that, you know, why is he going there? And, you know, what's he going to say? What's the president went there and basically said, you know, we can have a close relationship on two things. You know, what does he want? Big business. We want big contracts from Saudi Arabia and fighting radicalism and extremism. So that's a major kind of, of, of issue that one is asked uh, when you're talking uh, any place, uh, uh, you know, whether it's the EU uh, or you're or you're talking to, to governments in Europe or in Asia. In fact, I remember a funny one from here. This was a, a, a senior member of government in an Asian country. I won't <laughs> mention the country. And he said he wanted to see me. And I came in and he said, no notes. I have five questions for you. And he remembered his five questions. First question was, why would anybody become a Muslim? Now, he was in a country where you had a minority Muslim population. And I don't know if that was his reason, but it was, I said to him, you know, I said, nobody's ever quite asked me that, you know, who's a government person. But certainly the kinds of questions that are there. I mean, people ask you also to tell, tell you more about Islam, what a Muslim's like, et cetera. But that which catches people, look, what's going to catch a media story? A media story is going to be about whether or not the person who's being interviewed can talk about acts of violence and terrorism. Now, today, it can also be whether or not it's done against Muslims. But in the past, it would be more the brushstroking of a majority of mainstream Muslims by the, the very, you know, terrible things that occurred with, you know, with 9-11 and with many other things in the world. So, but it's still there, you know, there's still that side of it, but they'll ask about women in Islam. Uh, they'll ask about uh, even why, why do people, you know, wear a hijab? Uh, they won't be aware of the fact that Muslims in America, uh, when it comes to areas of education um, and, and many areas, rank right up there with, if you will, the top religions, uh, you know, uh, in the world, or even when you talk to them about pluralism and diversity, Muslim attitudes about pluralism, you know, at least three quarters of, of, of Muslims, you know, believe that other people, A, that others worship God in, in other faiths. They also, you know, they, they have lots of, they'll talk about, do they have friends who are non-Muslims? And many do to a percentage that many whites don't. I mean, we're in a country now where white supremacists have really emerged, as in Europe, you know, white supremacism and white nationalism. And so, you you know, you find that, ironically, a lot of that number, which is a significant minority, they have nothing to do and they don't want to have anything to do with any immigrants, let alone Jews and Muslims, etc. So, you know, you're, this is a very interesting time to be still to be out there. While the numbers have improved uh, in, in terms of some positive attitudes among Americans, you have a significant, significant minority. Uh, that not only are dangerous intellectually, but we've seen uh, when you look at, for example, the Southern Poverty Law Center statistics, the FBI statistics on the, the number of anti-Muslim and anti-Semitic groups that have grown up, but even more broadly, the number of white supremacist groups. In fact, the head of the FBI said, I think this past year, that that was the number one terrorist threat in the United States. Hmm. Well, you just use the word intellectually dangerous. 
What do you mean by that? Well, I think that there, there are, uh, I think that, for example, I mean, Islamophobes, Islamophobic authors, etc., are intellectually dangerous uh, in, in what they do. Uh, we, for example, at the center have had at times uh, individuals who are hired by some of these organizations um, who show up for, we've, we've had one in particular who shows up for almost every talk that we give and then, then puts out a very, more often than not, a very biased, in fact, distorted representation of what's there. And with the internet, that goes out. And for people, they don't know where to get their information. One of the reasons we started Oxford Islamic Studies Online about 10 years ago was that Oxford, and, and I became the editor in chief, and I wanted to create a portal where people who wanted to know, have information on Islam, on Muslims, Islamic history, art, etc., could go and know from the very name of the organization, Oxford University and Oxford University Press, that they could trust it. Because if you go on the internet, you see things like family security, you know, uh, you know, you see things, you know, that all have these pajama media, these innocuous kinds of, that are often very anti-foreign, anti-immigrant, uh, you know, anti-Muslim and publish this stuff all of the time. And a number of these organizations are uh, advisors to the current administration. And one or two of them have served in the administration. Yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> the, the, you know, Mr. Miller, who sits there in the White House, uh, invents al almost everything which is what comes out anti-Muslim or anti-immigrants there. Well, Mr. Miller worked for David Horowitz. Yeah. So, so, so tell us, what are the positive trends which you see in the Muslim society internationally? Well, I think I think in, in, t in terms of a Muslim society internationally, um, you know, I'd have to say that no, what one has to do to understand it today very much is to see uh, a the incredible diversity, uh, and that's positive as well as negative. Okay, in terms of development, in terms of attitudes towards education, in terms of gender issues, etc. But certainly, one of the things that a lot of people miss are the number of Muslim societies. Uh, in terms of education, for example, where uh, women are uh, uh, equal to men and, and sometimes uh, more women uh, are graduating with university degrees uh, and the societies in which uh, women are more and more uh, emerging, uh, you know, in, in the workplace uh, and, uh, and even working in government, but often at, at lower levels. Uh, you know, unless they're lucky enough, as in the recent past, to be the daughter of somebody who was the head of state, and then they they succeed. Um, I think also that that globalization, in particular the internet, and also globalization of travel, has meant a real, uh, in some countries, uh, a real uptick uh, in terms of uh, their sort of uh, outlook on the world, their connection to the world. It, it, it doesn't require that one uh, as as it would 20 or 30 years ago, that to really understand, if you will, another another part of the globe, you had to go and study there. Because if you were in your in your own country, you wouldn't have that kind of exposure. At the same time, there is a, a as I said before, um, it's a radical side uh, in terms of white supremacism uh, in Europe, uh, but also in terms of anti-Muslim attitudes uh, in India, in China, etc. Um, but there's also um, a hardcore, um, a hardcore uh, conservatism. Now, this will get some of my conservative friends upset, uh, or if you will, hardcore traditionalists, uh, which is which can be problematic. It doesn't mean the traditionalists. And you, you mean hardcore conservative or uh, among the Muslims you're talking about? Yeah, all Muslims, uh, and I don't mean that in a dangerous sense, but I mean uh, a, a conservatism that at times. Uh, can stifle uh, open discussion within their own societies overseas. Uh, uh, and I think that that, that becomes uh, an issue. So that if in a number of countries, if you're a, a reformer, a reformist thinker, it's not a free play of ideas. And you can wind up with, uh, with you know, uh, groups, for example, of very conservative ulama uh, denouncing something like a, a, another group or a group of individuals that are talking about the relationship between uh, Islam and democracy or talking about uh, improving gender relations. Uh, we, yeah. you know, we, we need to conclude, but I still want to, one minute. To, uh, I mean, we're just coming close to the show time. 
but uh, about you know the struggle for the democracy elections and islam which in some way showed up in arab spring and of course people remember egypt and syria and uh, uh, libya but people forget about all of that what is happening in tunis morocco or now in sudan uh, do you think that desire for freedom democracy and islam will continue to come back in another format or crushing arab spring was that was it no i think it will come back i think the crushing of the arab spring means that there's been an upsurge of authoritarianism authoritarian governments have become more authoritarian on the one hand uh, but if you look at a book called uh, the future of islam and democracy after the arab spring which i did with oxford with two of my colleagues uh, we take a different approach when it talks about the future, and there will be a webinar uh, on August 11th that will be out of London that I've put together on this very theme. And so if uh, we'll try to put something on, on our website to advertise it. But I think in the short term, uh, there definitely has been a shutting down in many societies. And COVID-19 has been used in countries like Algeria uh, and, and other a number of other Muslim countries as an excuse for stopping public discussion, uh, you know, public groups meeting. Um, and so I think that that in the short term puts a lot of pressure uh, in, in a number of countries where there's an attempt to put the lid on really, uh, you know, uh, freedom of thought, freedom of expression, and the right for a population to have a say in terms of the kind of government that they have. Well, thank you so much, uh, Professor Svazicu, sparing your own hour with us. Uh, we learn a great deal and always very thankful to your work and to your teacher, Farupi, who put you in a place where there were no jobs. And then finally, you got your Lexus. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you. This is Imam Malik Mujahid, and we have been talking with Professor Janus Vazito. You are watching uh, Galaxy 19 Satellite, uh, Amazon Fire TV, Raku, and other social media. And we're always on our 24 7 on MuslimNetwork.tv. Thank you, Samaya Haider, for producing our show, and Aliza Majid, who is our intern producer. Peace. Salam.